Hi, I'm Rabbi Sarah Mulhern, and I'm honored to welcome you all to our continuing series of rabbinic learning webinar opportunities. Um, before we begin with our Pesach webinar, I want to encourage you to start counting down to our Shavuot learning with Orit Avneri, which will be on June 3rd. Um, and as always, to invite you to come this summer in Jerusalem to our rabbinic learning um, at the Machon Hartman Beit Midrash from July 9th to 18th. Um, and with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shaul Magid, a senior research fellow and faculty member at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America and distinguished fellow in Jewish studies at Dartmouth College, who will share with us Hasidic interpretations of the Arab Rav and what they can tell us about the complex relationship between wealth and freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and um, welcome all. Uh, what I'd like to do in a very short period of time is to uh, engage uh, in a kind of exercise of illustrating a case of um, what one might call, to borrow a, a, a locution from Hannah Arendt, the rabbinic imagination without banisters. And that is a particular case where the rabbis are able to think almost in a boundless way about something <clears throat> that exists in the Torah and construct a, ver a variety of of ways of understanding something that the Torah gives us actually no context for and no reference for, reference for. There are a couple of cases in the Torah, and there are two that I want to mention, one that I want to actually speak about, where, th this, where Scripture mentions something almost in passing, only one time in the entire Tanakh, gives us no context, gives us no reference, and in a certain way, it would be very easy for the rabbis to simply pass by and not pay that much attention to it. But actually, they do the opposite. They, they, they end up spending an incredible amount of time constructing a whole mythology around this particular thing that's mentioned in passing. And the two cases that I, I want to mention, the, the one case is the story of Enoch, which is really a, a kind of pre-Diluvian character who's mentioned once in the Torah, says that he goes and walks with God. It doesn't mention that he dies. The rabbis aren't that really interested in Enoch because in general they're not really not interested in the kind of pre-Diluvian pre history. But Christianity and early Christians who were Jews were incredibly interested in Enoch. And there's a whole literature of, called Enochic literature written about this particular mythic character. The other case which the rabbis are more interested in, because the rabbis are more in general interested in the, the, the story of the, the Jews leaving Egypt than they are of the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, is this strange case of this unknown group of people called the Arab Rav. Um, in Exodus 12, in verse 37, the verse basically tells us, V'yisubane Yisrael meramse sukota k'sheish me'ot elaf raglei gvarim levad mitaf, describing the Jews going out of Egypt, and then the strange thing, v'gama erev rav ala itam b'tzona b'kar miknei kaved mo'od. And then it says, and these erev rav went out with them, and they went out with a lot of cattle and wealth. It's not clear if it's talking about the Erev Rav or the Israelites, but it doesn't matter. So this term, the Erev Rav, we don't know who they are. They're not explained. They're never mentioned again. Deuteronomy doesn't go back and doesn't speak about them when, when speaking about the Exodus. You would think that the rabbis could just simply pass by this and say, we don't really have anything to say. The Torah really doesn't have to tell us about it. And as far as we know, these people aren't Israelites anyway. But as a matter of fact, they become some somehow, in the rabbinic retelling of the narrative of the Exodus, they become this, in some way the central character. And what I want to do very briefly is trace from the Midrash through the medieval text of the Zohar and a 16th century text by Chaim Vital, the student of Isaac Luria, a process whereby the Erev Rav become the kind of quintessential scapegoat and are blamed for everything, including the golden calf. And we'll see in the case of the Zohar where the Erev Rav really become the kind of uh, the serpent of the Exodus, the serpent in terms of the one who seduces Eve in the garden. They become the corollary to the serpent uh, in Exodus, and they are the seducers of Israel to sin. And then there seems to be a kind of uh, a, a retreat from that in, in Chaim Vital, where he actually says that, this, that the Erev Rav 
were very likely a group of Egyptians who probably were converts to the nation of Israel, and they actually have a higher status than the rest of the nations. And then bring us to the text that I want to focus on, and that is Yoel Teitelbaum of Satmer and his Divrei Yoel, where he basically makes an argument why the Arab Rav were necessary in order for to Israel to pass this test of what he calls Nisayona Osher, the test of wealth, which is going to be the central piece of what I want to say. But before we get there, it's, it, it, the, 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 the journey from the verse itself through the Midrash, through the Zohar, through the 16th century will kind of show the way in which the rabbis are imagining without banisters. And then we'll come back and we'll see how Teitelbaum actually brings it into a much more um, contemporary case of showing how, in fact, the story of the Exodus and the Erev Rav is really about creating the conditions for setting up the Israelite commonwealth once they go into the land of Israel. So, again, the, Midra, the, 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 the scripture, scripture basically just gives us nothing, basically. It gives us the Erev Rav and it moves on. In the Midrash, which is the second text on your sheet, we see there's already the beginning of trying to construct the Erev Rav as some kind of negative force. The Midrash begins by talking, uh, by, by citing the verse that God is telling Moses after the Israelites build the golden calf. God says to Moses, Lech red ki amcha. Your people are acting in an, in an inappropriate manner. And then um, the Midrash says, Ha'am lo ne'amar ela amcha draws a kind of uh, uh, inference from the fact that God says your people and not people or my people. Amalo Kodesh Baruch Moshe, a guy is really saying to Moses, Amcha Asua Te'egel, your people, Moses, cre- made the calf. Now you would think that your people means the Israelites, but the Midrash says no. Your people is actually the Erev Rav. My people are the Israelites, God says, but your people are the Erev Rav. She'ani amarti lecha, and so God says to Moses, look, I have told you, the verse in Exodus, I am going to bring out my people from the land from uh, from Egypt. And you said to me, no, also bring the Erev Rav out with them, because it's good to be able to receive, it's good to be able to absorb those people who are Shavim. Apparently, those people who want to become part of the nation of Israel. And God says, I told you, Moses, what's going to happen if I allow you to bring your people, meaning the Erev Rav, out. They are the ones that actually built the calf. Not the Israelites, but the Erev Rav. That they are idolaters and they seduced Israel to become idolaters with them. So this is already the first step where, first of all, the Erevav are called Amshel Moshe. They are called Moses' people, which is kind of interesting because Moses plays that double role of being both an Egyptian and an Israelite at the same time. And that they are the ones that are actually the causers of the Israelite sin. If we move from there very quickly to the Zohar, the Zohar begins to reify the Erev Rav in a much more profound and problematic way. It begins with the same basic assumption that the Midrash plays with, which is that the Erev Rav are uh, the cause of, of the sin of the golden calf, but it goes further than that. The Zohar says, Tachazi, come and see. Eloha ve'inun Erev Rav if the Erev Rav had not attached themselves to Israel, they would have never actually done the act. They would have never done the sin. Of, they would have never in, had done transgressed with the sin of golden calf. And they would have basically uh, prevented the deaths of thousands or hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of Israelites. So that the whole basic idea of the Erev Rav is they become the quintessential ga- scapegoat, pretty much going along the lines of the Midrash. But then the Zohar continues, Since they did this, and the they seems to be the Erev Rav, 
Garimu kola, garimu mota, garimu shibud malchaon, garimu d'abru imi ruche kadma'i, garimu dometim Yisrael. So it says, now the whole thing is unraveling. Because the Erev Rav caused them to do, caused the Israelites to build the golden calf, they built the calf. This is, they're the cause of Israel being uh, um, enslaved among the nations. This basically caused the first luchot, the first... Um, uh, tablets to be destroyed, and this was basically they said they caused everything. Everything that happens negative to Israel is because of the Arab Rav. But then the, the next case, and the fourth case of the Zohar goes even further by saying, "Ein bein David ba adi kalum that when the Messiah comes, all of the all of the, the, the souls that need to be in bodies will be born and everything will be renewed. And it says, Zimna mit abrin erev rav mi alma, that the Erev Rav will be destroyed from the world. Now, in, if you go to the second paragraph, you see what, what, what the Zohar does is actually make the connection between the Erev Rav and the serpent in the Garden of Eden. By saying, Va'alayu itmaru, we will say, Va'nachashayu arum mekol chayot asadeh, right, the serpent was naked from all of the, uh, all of the um, or however we understand, arum, from all of the animals in the garden. Arum l'ram makol chavin di'inu ba'al meda'ovde kochovin mazolos, that the serpent becomes again this demonic force. And the inun banoi denachash the kodmai lepatei lahaba. It's really the, the 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 serpent that seduces Eve. That's a kind of standard play, certainly of the Zohar, but even of the Drash. And then it continues, citing the Talmud. The Talmud basically tells us the serpent was the one who basically impregnated Eve, and in doing so, kind of brought poison into the Israelite soul or body or collective and that was the cause of the sin. But now the Zohar twists and says, the Erev Rav inu dahavi zuhama da'atil. It's not the serpent that actually brought forth evil into the body of Israel, but actually it was the Erev Rav. Da'atil nachash v'chava. That the Erev Rav was the force that actually bring, puts the poison and seminates the poison into Eve. So I think what, what you see in the Zohar here is like the full demonization of the Erev Rav. The Erev Rav go from being a completely undefined, undefined uh, um, uh, group of people in the Torah, they become as idolaters those who cause the Israelites to sin, and now in the Zohar they become a full-blown demonic force, as demonic as the serpent of the garden. Vital, in the 16th century, in his book Eitz Tov, which is a book that he wrote both before and after he met his teacher Isaac Luria, sees it a little bit differently, using the same reference that we looked at in the Zohar and in the Midrash. And we read it in the English. All the people saw the voices, speaking about the Sinai event, know that God took Israel out of Egypt. This is not the case with the Erev Rav, who were taken out by Moses, Amcha, right, as the, the Midrash in Tanchuma says, Moses, it's your people. As it says, who, took, uh, who you took out of Egypt. It does not say, I took them out. And he seems to be citing that midrash in some form. Therefore, the Erev Rav are called Amshel Moshe, the people of Moshe. They are no worse than the nations. And now you see the, begin of the beginning of the reversal. They are no worse than the nations. In fact, they're better since they came out in order to convert, as we will explain. And I think later on, what, Vic- what Vital is really doing here, I think, is really constructing the Erev Rav as returning conversos in the 16th century. Those Jews who had converted in Spain and Portugal to Catholicism that were now returning eastward into Palestine and into the Jewish communities in southern Europe, they become, in a sense, the case of the Erev Rav. They are the Shavim, the returners. So in a sense, they are, uh, they are becoming de-demonized in Vital's text. On the third day, God descended and all the people saw. The word all includes the Erev Rav, who also saw God's descent with their eyes. This is not the case with the rest of the world, who only heard the voices, but did not know where they were coming from until the time of Bilam Ben Beor. So, what we, the, the step, there's a, there's a reversal of the demonization in the 16th century, that the Erev Rav actually are, yes, Amshel Moshe, in that they are Shavim. 
There's no mention here of them being the cause of the sin. There's no mention here of them being connected to the serpent. There's no mention of, of them being evil. In fact, they have a status that is higher than the rest of the nations. So this is all really a prelude to a drasha in Divrei Yoel of Moshe Taitobam of Satmer, who I think in, doesn't really necessarily take exactly what Vital is doing, but I think he's continuing the reversal of saying, actually, the Erev Rav, and this is really in a certain sense countering the Midrash, right? Because the Midrash is saying God said to Moshe, don't take these people out. Moshe said, yes, but it's good for us to le kabel shavim. And God says, I'm telling you it's not going to end well. And Teitelbaum basically says, that can't be the case. It doesn't make any sense. Why would basically God enable a group of people to go out that God knew was going to actually destroy the entire thing, that, the, the, entire, the entire great plan of the covenant with the Israelites? There has to be something that the Erev Rav do. There has to be some purpose. There has to be something that they are there to accomplish. And this is how he begins to understand it through... Um, a Sifri passage uh, from, from Sifrei Dvarim, which reads as follows, Moreover, a mixed multitude went out. And here he says, the er and I'm reading from the sixth text, the earlier verse regarding Abraham is fulfilled, gadol, and they went out with great wealth. Now we know that the Israelites went out with great wealth. And we know that Avraham went out with great wealth. Somehow, the Sifrei is making a connection between the era of Rav and this notion of great wealth. Now, what's it, you know, one of the interesting things just simply about the, about the Sifrei text is we weren't able to find the text. Teitelbaum quotes this text this way in the beginning of his Drasha. And that text has been quoted in another, a number of other places, one of them being the Yismach Moshe, which was a text of a great-great-grandfather, a great-great or great-great-great-grandfather of, of Yoel Teitelbaum, named Moshe Teitelbaum in the Yismach Moshe. And it's very likely that Yoel Teitelbaum probably took the Midrash, or maybe it was a constructed Midrash that didn't exist, is, exist as it was from there. In any event, what is this idea that the Erevav are somehow connected with the promise of Ab uh, the, the Abrahamic promise of going out with great wealth? So the text begins as follows. I'm not going to be able to read the whole thing, and there are a lot of intricate twists and turns in the text. I mean, Teitelbaum is really a master darshan. Um, my, my Rosh Hashiv in Jerusalem told me once, um, the two greatest Talmud Chachamim in the 20th century were the Chazonish and the Satmar Rebbe. And you can see from his work, I mean, not only is he, you know, is he just simply incredibly learned, but the, the depth and intricacy of his ability to be a darshan is really almost unparalleled. In any event, he begins as follows. V'nira li pirush. This is how I understand the Sifri connection between the Erev Rav and Rahush Gadol. Every, 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 every human um, life, in a sense, Everybody is confronted with some kind of force that's trying to pull them away from the right way to live. Call it the Yetzirah. And there are really two types of tests. Nisayon there's the test of poverty and the test of wealth. And as it's quoted in Sifrei Musar, he doesn't tell us where. The test of wealth is actually greater than the test of poverty. Even though we learn in the Talmud passage in Erevin that poverty can actually, in a certain sense, make somebody crazy and also make somebody um, unfaithful, can destroy faith. Alula Adam Yoter Tova. 
וכמו שכתוב, וישמן ישרום ויבעט. Even though that's the case, even though poverty can be incredibly destructive to a person's, to a person's sense of, the, of themselves, a sense of the world, and also a sense of God, even if that's the case, wealth is even more difficult. Why is it more difficult? He quotes from the verse in Deuteronomy 32.15, V'yishamein Yishirun V'ya'at. Yishirun is very often referred, a reference to Israel, but Yishirun here, reference to Israel, somebody being upright. So basically, what is it they saying? Basically, that they were upright, but, and this is going from Ibn Ezra's commentary to the verse, they were upright, but, right, they got fat and they, 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 they lost this themselves of themselves. And there's another verse that says, maybe you will be sated and you will end up being, being drawn off of the, uh, of the path. And your heart will be high and you will forget. Then in, in a sense what Taibam is saying is wealth has the potential to increase a sense of self, self uh, uh, increase a self-image such that one basically forgets God. It's even more so the case when somebody is living amongst, pe- living amongst wealthy people, living in a wealthy class. People that are simply following their own desires and have the ability to follow their own desires because they have the means to do so. So he says, yes, if you have money, if you have resources, you can actually do whatever you want. The only thing that's going to prevent you from doing so is some kind of sense of responsibility or fidelity or belief in God. In a sense, I think Teitelbaum is writing to his own community, who are now living in America, who are now moving up the economic class, who are living in New York City, who are basically living amongst, from the perspective of where he came from in Hungary, incredible wealth and incredible privilege. And he's saying to him, this is your Nisayona Osher. You thought it was difficult to be poor and to be an Oved Hashem. It's far more difficult to be rich and to be an Oved Hashem. Okay, we haven't really gotten to how the Erev Rav fit in here, but he begins with this idea of Nisayona Osher and Nisayona Ani. And of course, the wealth, the link to the wealth is V'yatsu B'rachush Gadol, that they went out with great wealth. That, it, that was part of the promise, that they had to go out with great wealth. And then the next paragraph, which I don't have time to look at, he basically tries to prove this by the story of Jacob and Esau, where Jacob says... To uh, when Jacob says to Esav, "Im Lavan Garti," that I lived with Lavan, but Tariag Mitzvot Shemarti, and yet I kept the Mitzvot. Right? That's kind of a famous, uh, a famous passage. Velo um, Lamadati Mamaasim Haraim, and I didn't learn. This is the Midrash from the evil ways of Esav. What he was saying was that he says, "Vahamit Kaven Yaakov Avinu." So Yaakov was saying to Esav when he says, Im Lavan Garti, Vatariag Mitzvot Shemarti, saying, I actually was able to overcome the Nesayona Osher. I had the ability to be able to be sucked in and seduced by wealth and privilege, and I wasn't. And that becomes, in a sense, Jacob's great testimony. Not that he was able to overcome poverty, but that he was able to overcome wealth. And then in the following paragraph, we begin to see how he ties it together. They go out into the desert, and what did they take with them? They took all of the silver and all of the gold from the Egyptians. So they already went out with great wealth. So he says, Even though he actually, they took out all this wealth. So Taito Bam says, There's no great, What does wealth mean in the desert? What does gold mean in the desert? 
It just means that they had to schlep around more stuff. But there was no Nisayon HaOsher. They weren't able to actually withstand this test of wealth. But it created the conditions for the possibility for them to do it. And then he kind of comes back, to, he, comes, he comes into the Erev Rav. Lule HaErev Rav Shitchabru Imahem Vahaya Lehem Mimi Lilmod Laasot HaRav Be'enei Hashem Va'al Yedei Rechush Gadol If it wasn't for the fact that the Erev Rav went with them, and the Erev Rav became exemplars of the trappings of wealth and privilege, right? They, in other words, the Erev Rav were actually living as fat cats with all of their wealth. They, were, they didn't actually fall into the pit of or not the pit, but the trap of wealth. This is really what the the mess, the promise was that God made with Abraham, that the Israelites will go out with great wealth. Not that they will go out with great wealth, but they would be able to withstand the Nesayona Osher. And they would never have been able to do it without the Erev Rav. So HaErev Rav Itam, that the Erev Rav without with them, was not like the Midrash and the Tanhuma says, that God says, Moshe, it's your people, let's not bring them out. And Moshe says, yeah, they're going to, you know, they're Bali Tshuva. And God is saying, this is not going to end well. He's saying, no, actually they were needed. Because without them as the exemplars of the abuse of wealth, the Israelites would never been, have been able to uh, withstand the Nisayona Osher. Now, they had already withstood the Nisayona Oni, the, 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 the test of poverty. That was the 400 years of servitude in, the, in, in, the, in, in Egypt. So that part of it they were able to accomplish. But in order for them to actually go into Eretz Yisrael and build a functioning society, they would first have to be able to withstand this Nisayona Osher. So continuing just a little bit more in the text. He asks the question, says Avram went out with great wealth. But what would, what would, there was no real test for Avram Avinu to go out with great wealth. He had already proven his fidelity to God. A person that had already achieved that level of spiritual um, perfection would not have been seduced by wealth. It's already been understood elsewhere. That this idea of wealth is really a reference to these sparks, divine sparks. Shall tziu Yisrael and Mitzrayim. And he says that's un, that's one way of understanding the rechush gadol that Avraham out that Avraham went out with. He went out with these holy sparks. But the Israelites who have not who had not actually yet achieved the level of spiritual perfection that Avraham, they had to go through this process of, um, of Nisayona Oni, which they did in Egypt, and then Nisayona Osher. So in a sense, um, in, in, in a sense, without the Erev Rav, the Israelites simply would have gone into the land, would have constructed a society, not having withstood the Nisayona Osher, and they would have basically been unable, according to the way Teitelbaum is understanding it, they would have been Ill, unable to withstand the wealth and privilege and power that they received through their, the covenantal promise of, uh, of God in the Torah. In a certain way, what I think Teitelbaum is doing, I think there are two things that he's doing. I think that he is speaking to his own community, that this is a post-Holocaust community, that in fact, the Nisayon 
Oni, uh, the Sayon Oni, we have accomplished. We've suffered in Europe, we've been destroyed in Europe, and we remained bound to and tied to a certain kind of fidelity to God at the covenant. America is precisely what is for him the Nisayon HaOsher. And I, I, think he's, I think one could say that he's speaking to a broader audience, or I, I can interpret him to as speaking to a broader audience, that this is precisely, I think, one of the great challenges of American Jewry, is the Nisayon HaOsher. Not only American Jewry, but I think 21st century Jewry in America and Israel, because Osher can mean also, Osher can mean wealth and privilege, and Osher can also mean power. And the challenge in the Sayona Osher is really that which stands between the Israelites surviving the Nisayona Oni and being able to really begin to create a vibrant and flourishing society that isn't going to be seduced by the traps of wealth and power. Now, in, 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 in the United States, I think that the Nisayona Osher is really much more about wealth than it is about power. In Israel, I think the Nisayona Osher is really about power more than it is about wealth. But the important piece, to, if we're going to kind of try to draw from Teitelbaum into our world, is that the Erev Rav, in a certain way, play this, play this important role that it's not that we have to actually deny the wealth that we have, or we have to ex exclude ourselves from the societies that we live in. An interesting thing for Teitelbaum, since he's very much an isolationist and an enclavist, but in fact, be able to engage with the world in a way that allows us to, um, to withstand the power of wealth and the power of, of privilege. In, in another essay some time ago, I, um, I made a distinction, which I think fits here too, between uh, the Jewish social gospel and the Jewish prosperity gospel. Now, social gospel and prosperity gospel, of course, are Christian terms that were developed in the uh, social gospel in the early 20th century, prosperity gospel in the later 20th century, uh, that, that in a certain sense, the Nisayon HaOsher and the Nisayon, ha, the Nisayon Oni and the Nisayon HaOsher frame differently. That the challenge of Christian America now is to be able to understand its own religious tradition through this notion of uh, are our commitments to the poor, or do we understand that prosperity itself is a blessing and a sign of God's um, uh, looking upon us with favor? And I think that regarding questions of social programs, regarding questions of what we call social justice, what we call tikkun olam, the idea of the, a Jewish social gospel, which I think is really what's happening in the world, in the Jewish world in America, with Jewish social justice movements, is being contested in a sense by this notion of a prosperity gospel, which basically says that we, the American Jews, are a wealthy, powerful community, and our wealth and privilege is not something that we should see as a test, but it's something that we should see as a sign of divine blessing. And in a sense, what Teitelbaum is suggesting is that the Exodus story itself the time that the Israelites are spending in the desert, Erev Rav She'alai Tam, the Erev Rav who go out with, with, with them, is the, is the template for the relationship between a social gospel and a prosperity gospel. And to interpret Jewish wealth and privilege as something that is a sign of divine blessing is in some way, on Teitelbaum's reading, succumbing to the seduction of the Erev Rav. That in a sense, it doesn't, it's something that is, it, it's the, a test and not a blessing that we, ne we have to resist, not resist by becoming poor, but resist by seeing that wealth is something that's not necessarily a privilege or a given or a blessing, but an opportunity. And the opportunity is not to deny it, as it wasn't in the case of the Israelites in the, in the, in the, in the desert. They, they, the, the test for Taliban wasn't that they give away all the gold and silver. The test was that they don't use that wealth as a resource to be able to 
feel like they're all powerful and they are autonomous agents in the world such that they don't have to actually um, abide by the covenantal promise that God made to them. And that becomes, in a sense, for, for Teitelbaum, the, um, the, notion, the promise of Chiatsu Berechush Gadol. That wealth only functions for him in a positive way if the recipients of that wealth are able to see that wealth not as a privilege but as a challenge. So maybe I'll stop here. So first of all, thank you so much, Shaul. Thank you so much, Yashaka. Um, I'll say we received a, a large number of questions in response to this teaching, um, which is really a testament to the importance and relevance of what you're bringing, um, and also means that I have to start by apologizing for the fact that I won't be able to ask you all of the excellent questions you received. Okay. Um, but I want to just start with, we received a whole group of questions. Um, which connect to, or ask you to connect to uh, contemporary groups and circumstances that may or may not be parallel to the era of Rav. Um, so for some examples, Rabbi Sheldendorf of Tiburn, uh, California asks, uh, Shaul, who do you see as the heir of Rav today? Um, and Rabbi Daniel Graber of Durham, North Carolina asks, um, whether you can say a little more about the idea of Rechush Gadol in terms of reparations uh, for formerly enslaved Israelites and what light that might shed on uh, parallel contemporary situations. Presumably he's thinking about reparations for African Americans in the, in the American context. Right. Um, well, to the first question, uh, that's uh, obviously the operative question, really, who are the Erev Rav? And I think that, that at least within the Hasidic milieu, the Erev Rav are always us. Now, there's the Erev Rav aren't, the Erev Rav, are, the Erev Rav aren't a group of people outside of us, but simply they already are just like Chometz is us, right? And the Erev Rav is us. That the challenge is, in a sense, in a sense, in a sense Title Baum alludes to that when he, when, in the beginning, when he says that Kozman Chiyotobo Olamazeh, our person's life Omed Tamid Al Al Sadeh Milchama Neged Hatzorer Hatzara Tzorer Hu Asatan Hu Ayetzahara. So that, in a certain sense, I think one way of reading Title Baum, and I think one way of reading the text in general, is that the Erev Rav is the Yetzahara, and it will always exist. He's trying to understand the role that the Erev Rav played in the historical narrative or the mythic historical narrative of the Exodus. But I think that in a, in a way, uh, one could understand that the Erev Rav is the Rechush Gadol, right? It is the wealth. That, is that, that creates the conditions of challenge. Now again, it's not to say that the... Uh, the Yetzirah, the Yetzirah, or the Erev Rav, or the Rechush Gadol has to be denied, but it has to be seen as a challenge. So it's not a question on the question of the, on the question of the Erev Rav, and on the question of the Yetzirah, and the question of the Rechush Gadol, because I think you can tie the three together in Teitelbaum's drush. It really, it, if it's seen as a challenge rather than a privilege, it stands in the Sayon. If it's seen as a privilege rather than a ch or a privilege, I don't mean privilege, by privilege I mean right, yeah. rather than a challenge, then basically the Erev Rav, in a sense, will prevent the Nisayon from even being viewed as a Nisayon. And I think that one of the big challenges is, not, is that, that when, when wealth is not seen as a challenge, that already is for him, or the way I read him, um, an embodiment of the Eight Sahara. To, uh, to Daniel's question, was Daniel, Daniel, mm -hmm. hey, what was it, could you repeat that question? Asking whether um, you can sort of reflect on any connection between what we learn from these texts about Rechush Gadol and the idea in general of reparations. I, I think he's referring to several midrashim that seem to understand the, the Israelites' right to the Rechush Gadol as sort of back pay for the 400 years of slavery. Right. So sort of wondering if any of this helps us reflect on the question of reparations in our contemporary context. Right, right, right. Good question, yeah. Um, no, I think the question of reparations um, is, is a fascinating question. I mean, by reparations, I mean reparations for slavery. 
Um, because, because, you, because I think that, that, that Daniel's right, that in a sense the Rechush Gadol is seen in the Midrashic literature as reparations. But the reparations themselves, the reparations also, I think, present both in the, in the Israelite case and in the, Afri and the Afro American case, they, they, they have, there are two parts to it. There are the responsibility that one side has to be able to, um, uh, to, to pay the other side for wrongdoing in the past. Now, remember the, the reparation case in the, in the Israelite narrative is not one of the Egyptians agreeing to give the Israelites, right? The Israelites basically took it, took, took, they basically stole it, right? And so the reparations there was really an act of justification. It was understood in the Midrashic mind as an act of justification. Here, it's interesting because when you have, if you look at some of the debates around, around um, slavery reparations in the Jewish community, mm -hmm. so there are many within the community that would be in favor of this, of reparations, and there are many in the Jewish community that are basically saying, no, why should we basically give any reparations to slaves? We, we weren't here in, during slavery, and um, you know, we were persecuted ourselves, and why aren't there reparations for Holocaust survivors? Of course, there were many reparations for Holocaust survivors. We know that part of Israel was built from Holocaust reparations. And I think that in a certain sense, the community that's arguing we shouldn't pay any reparations because we weren't there, I think that's, for me, that's an Erev Rav move. In other words, that's saying that since there's no direct connection between between the, between the existence of slavery and my station in the world, or even my ancestors' station in, in their world, that I don't have any responsibility to be a, to, in order to create a more equitable society, even though I am living in a state of Osher, hmm. right? Even though I'm able to do it. So in a way, that would be, to me, an example of the failure of the Niseona Osha. So we're picking up on a theme that I think you began to pull out there of the ways in which these stories land differently in different parts of our community. Um, Rabbi David Steinhardt from Book Raton asked uh, a question about Behold Dorvador, which I will add, I think, is really right. a question about the entire Exodus narrative and the entire experience of Pesach. Um, and his question is, um, how do you think about and respond to the fact that some Jews and Jewish communities take as the enduring lesson of those narratives a reminder to build empathy for the vulnerable and the strength and others take a reminder to build strength for ourselves in order to preserve our own Jewish safety and freedom and dignity. Um, so I'll ask you that in general and specifically in the context of the narrative which you've just presented, presented which I, I think really cuts both ways in the sense that it's, it's a really strong call to solidarity with the poor and awareness of class and privilege that is all built in some way on an othering and even demonizing of the other. Mm. Um, so I wonder how you sort of reflect on the, the variety of, of, of lessons that we could take from these stories. Right. I think that's a good question, and it would be, you know, to take both of these, because there are two competing narratives going on. The one narrative starts with Midrash Tanhuma and ends with the Zohar, which is really the demonization of the other, the demonization of the other, the Erev Rav as other, and that, that um, in a sense, becomes the strange justification for Israel's bad behavior. That in a way, Israel wouldn't have sinned if it wasn't for the Ararav. Israel wouldn't have built a golden calf if it wasn't for the Ararav. And the Zohar is willing to take it to the point where, you know, Adam and Chava wouldn't have sinned if it wasn't for the Ararav. So there's a sense that the outside is always um, dangerous, is always threatening, and therefore we have to build a society that is going to prevent the outside from destroying us. Vital takes a middle position, so there are three positions there. The one position is the demonization of the Erev Rav. Vital's position is actually the Erev Rav are part of us who have gone astray, who are finding their way back. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean Jews who were conversos, who were coming back to the Jewish society in the 16th century, which that may have been the case. Just in general, one of the things that the Vizal says su suggests is that the Erev Rav are nothing to be afraid of, but they should be absorbed. So there's the beginning of an opening to the possibility of engagement with this other. 
And then there's the third, the third model, which is Teitelbaum's model, which is saying, in order to be able to fully embody the covenantal responsibilities as God requires, we actually need to be engaged with the other. It's not just that we, sh we can be, but we actually need be. So the demonization completely falls away. However, what the Erev Rav do present as a model for Teitelbaum is, in a sense, living in a society that acts badly and somehow not succumbing to those particular um, hazards, those occupational hazards. And it's particularly on the question of, for him, it's particularly on the question of wealth. So in a way, you can take these three models, the model of demonization, the model of absorption, and the model of the challenge of living in the world as a necessary piece of a process of, human, of, of, of collective perfection, and, and see how they would kind of work within these different kind of uh, situations. But there's a piece of it that, if you can say, there's a piece of it, and you said at the end, that I don't really respond to. Yeah, I, I think for me, what I'm trying to push you on is that um, I'm not sure the three categories are so separable, because even Teitelbaum, who's doing a, a more self-focused um, kind of work in his Torah, is building on a metaphor that demonizes this character of the other. Now, the other is inside us, is a part of who we are, right. but this, the sort of story frame there is still, right. um, is still yeah. othering. Right. So yeah. I, I think the problematics are not as, as easy to sideline right. as that. And, and, and so in that context, I sort of am curious, um, well, and I think the original question was really about like different communities are going to hear the takeaway message here very differently right. and, and how you think about that piece. Right. I, I, no, that's good. That's good. Yeah, no, it, it's clear. And I, I probably was not, I, I, I misspoke. I mean, the Erev Rav are bad people for Taino Bell. There's right. no doubt about that. They're bad people, but they're necessary. Right. Right. And it's precisely the model that has to not be emulated. But what I wanted to really kind of get at is that I think that each generation, and this goes to the door of a door, right? Mm -hmm. That I want to see it a little bit differently, this idea of door of a door. Um, uh, if you look at the Haggadah, if you're called door of a door, right? That every generation, every, gener every, every generation, I think maybe that he's referring to the Haggadah passage. Every generation, right, then the come come destroy you. I think one can understand that, that to say that, yes, every generation, the potential for destruction exists in a very different way. It's not simply that every generation people hate us and they're going to come to destroy us. Every generation, there are forces, sometimes embodied in others and sometimes embodied in ourselves, that will always be the nisayon of that generation. And those, those, those nisayonot are, are different. So that the nisayon of the generation after the Holocaust was a very different Nisayon than the Nisayon of early 21st century America. And I think that's a bit hard to get our heads around because we like to see a certain, you know, a continuity of the enemy. But the enemy really is actually never the same. The enemy is always different. And I think that there's a stark dissonance and difference that the enemy of the post-Holocaust era is that there was a generation that certainly rose up to try to destroy us in a very literal, in a very physical, right, horrific way. And the Nisayon was basically to remain attached to one's sense of identity or fidelity to tradition in any way you understand it in light of that. So it basically the Nisayon of the generation of the Holocaust was where was God in the Holocaust? Right? That was their nisayon, coming to some kind of understanding of what that meant. I don't think that's the nisayon of this generation. I think the nisayon of this generation, we might ask that question theoretically, theologically, and we might have interesting st things to say about that. But I think that question largely played itself out in the post-Holocaust theology of the 1970s. I think in America, our Nisayon is really this Nisayon of Osher, right? 
What does it mean to be in a position of power and privilege, the likes of which the Jews have probably never been in in the history of Jewish civilization? Now, we can talk about anti-Semitism, and we can talk about anti-Israelism, and we can talk about all of the things that exist, but if that's the focus, if that's our focus, I think that we're not really getting at our Nisayon. Because mm -hmm. that really, in a certain sense, is a focus of another generation. That was the focus of another generation. That's not to say that that doesn't exist now and doesn't have to be dealt with and engaged and talked about and examined and interrogated in all kinds of ways. But ultimately, the Nisayon that's going to actually potentially sever the ties between Jews and their sense of fidelity to tradition is not Ilan Omar. It's basically incredible wealth, incredible prosperity, the ability to do whatever we want, to go wherever we want, to say whatever we want, to be in the, you know, in, you know to be next door to the Oval Office of the White House. I mean, that is, that level, the level of prosperity that we're experiencing and power that we're experiencing is really unparalleled. And I think that is our era of Rav. And, and, and I'm sort of trying to put myself in the mind of uh, a rabbi who is listening to this Torah and thinking about how to go out and teach it. Um, and it seems clear to me that um, there's lots of implications here that are very external and very political. And also, you kind of keep drawing us back to the ways in which Teitelbaum's move, at least, is very much an internalizing psychological right. read. Um, and uh, the easy answer to the question I'm about to ask is like, yes, both. But I wonder if right. you have a sense of like, as as this Torah is taught, are you more interested in the political frame or actually in this as sort of psychology and Musar internal frame? I, I'm not sure, I mean, it's a good question. I'm not sure um, from my perspective that there's really as much of a distinction between those two as, as, as others might think. I think that um, uh, our ability to externalize our sense of of power and privilege is in part due to the ability to psychologically and emotionally and existentially work out the, not, not necessarily how we, um, well, I would say it this way, how we work out and process the very radical shift that many of us have, have experienced over the course of, let's say, two or three generations, from having immigrant parents who were poor to being wealthy. And that in the historical in the historical trajectory, that's a very, very, very short period of time. Within about 50 or 60 years, we've actually made we've made that move. And I think that 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 therefore how we externalize that in relationship to how we relate to the world around us how we relate to the society around us, how we relate to other people who are experiencing the Sayona Oni. Because there are plenty of people in the world now who are experiencing the Sayona Oni, right? And we've experienced that and have learned from that. And what our relationship to those people are and the way in which our wealth and privilege could benefit others to, to get them over the hump of their own the Sayona Oni, is something that I think is both internal, internal and external. Yeah, that's hopeful. Um, to take in a little bit of a different direction, Rabbi David Segal of Houston in Texas um, asks that sort of in addition to the ways in which you've, I think, so beautifully shown that the Arab Rav can be an entry point for our communities to having these conversations about wealth and about class, um, what are the ways forward uh, of using the Arab Rav to really have conversations about race and ethnicity in the American Jewish community? Um, and I'll maybe I'll sort of add my own sense of the ways in which these texts could both be incredibly helpful for those conversations and also quite painful to teach in the context of a reality, as you've pointed out very much in your scholarship, right. where many of us have family members who are not Jewish or who have become Jewish later in their lives. And many of us are teaching in communities which include in them non-Jewish individuals or individuals have chosen to join the Jewish community. So how do these texts help us get into that conversation and also how, how do we be cautious about them? No. I think that's that's a great question too. Again, I think there's the there's you know it, first of all, I think one of the things that we can do is is acknowledge and and examine the demonization narrative of the Arab Rav, 
and to show that that may have in fact been a, a, a moment in time. I mean, it may have lasted a millennia in terms of Jewish literary history, but the fact that, that the demonization of the Erev Rav really does not produce healthy results vis-a-vis a, a, a people's understanding of their place in the world. Because ultimately the demonization of the Erev Rav is saying the Jews are not responsible. The Jews are the victims. The Jews were seduced. And one, one of the things that, that, that always, that issue that's raised in that is that why is Moshe get off scot-free here? I mean, why, why is Moshe not taken to task? I mean, the Zohar is saying that the entire world, Adam and Eve, the flood, the, the, everything that happens bad in the world is the Erev Rav, and the Tanhuma says, God said to Moshe, I told you so, this was going to happen, and yet Moshe not, not, doesn't seem to be, you know, taken to task. And the way in which we're able to, in a sense, create a counter-tradition to the Erev Rav. How could we understand the Erev Rav from our privileged place today? And I don't, I don't mean privileged place vis-a-vis wealth necessarily, but privileged place today and where we stand as a Jewish community. How can we re-envision the era of Rav as something different than the demonization narrative? And I gave two examples of the de-demonization in Vital and in Teitelbaum, but it's really, I, the floor is open, I guess, for all of us. Like, how can we think about um, what it means to be othered. How, does it, how can we think about that on, on the question of race? How can we think about it in terms of privilege? How can we think about it in terms of class? How does, what does it mean, the era of Allah Itam? What does it mean that they went out with Egypt, with the Israelites? Should we actually invite those people into our communities? Should they play a role? Should they become a part? Is the de-othering of the era of Rav something that we should think about as the midrashic, the midrashic work that we have to do? You've situated a lot of this conversation very much, very much in the context of North American Judaism and the implications of this Torah for our community. But you sort of gestured at your sense of the ways in which this Nisayon Shel Osher is also facing uh, Israeli Jewish communities. Um, and I wonder if you can just say a few more sentences about the implications here or how you imagine this Torah would be received in an Israeli context. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't get into that, but I think that, uh, you know, it, it reminded me of something Ben-Gurion said back in the 30s, um, and I think it, it, it really uh, speaks to this. Um, he said that the, the failure of success, the fa and I'm paraphrasing, the failure or success of Zionism will depend upon how we treat the Arabs. And I think that in a certain way, um, the I Arabs are seen in some way as the Arab Rav, right? They are Itam, they are with us, they live with us, they are part of our, our community. And I think you can take the demonization narrative of the Zohar and the Tanhuma, which says, oh, you see, yeah, we're not acting well, but it's because of them. It's because of what they do. They make us act this way. We would be much better, but they would make us act this way. Or you can say, yes, that is part of the experience. Part of the experience is that Israeli or Jewish sovereignty in a Jewish nation state will always have an Erev Rav. And according to Teitelbaum, we need that. We need them. And Buber says that in his critique of Ben-Gurion about about uh, not allowing the refugees to return after 1948, he said, we need the Arabs, not because they will help us in our social or economic system. We need them existentially and spiritually. We need to live with an other in order not to become uh, a kind of isolated self which doesn't have a, an understanding of what coexistence means. So that's what I would say about that. So we're drawing to the end of our time, and so I just want to give you an opportunity um, to, to end by sharing the sort of one thought or the one question that you hope uh, the rabbis and educators who are listening to this will, right. will take from right. this Torah. So I, I think the last thing I want to say is that, as I said before, I think the Erev Rav is a case study of um, Jewish imagining without banisters. In other words, we have no limits because the Torah gives, has, gives us no sense of who they are, what they are, or, or, you know, or, 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 or how, they, 
how they function. And I've given you a couple of examples, but it, it, what I would suggest is that this notion of the Erev Rav, and I, the way I want to define the Erev Rav is the proximate other. Right? The way in which the proximate other in America, in Israel, wherever it, wherever it is, the proximate other is a, not only a necessary, but also a crucial aspect of the Jewish experience. How we engage with the proximate other, how we view and identify with the proximate other, the ways in which we feel responsibility to the proximate other, I think is a central part of being able to overcome this Nisayona Osher, understood very broadly. Thank you, Shaul, for this thank you, beautiful, Seth. provocative Torah. And I want to thank um, all the rabbis who joined us all, really all around the world to learn together today. Um, and I hope we will all find our way to liberation. And a Chag Kasher Chag Kasher to everyone. Thank you very much.